So this word behola, this word behola, according to some, the word behola, we talk about not in my, behola is like when you get panicked about something. You, you're, you're, you're in a state of behola. It's like you're walking and you see the train. I just saw this morning. The train, the train comes. I saw a lady, she was not younger than 70 years old. And she starts running for the train. And, and I'm just like, I hope, this, I hope this ends okay over here. You know, I just worry about her health. Yeah, relax, there'll be another train. You know, they, they, you know, you, know they're, they're, you miss this one, there will, there will be another one. Within eight minutes, there's going to be another train. Sometimes people get all panicked. You know, Rav Dessler was once walking with the Talmud, and he started running for a train. They're walking in England, and as a, the Talmud started to run, Rav Dessler grabbed his hand and said, don't run. That's Behola. We don't act with Behola. Behola means like form of, a form of, you just lost your composure, complete losing of your composure. You, you went into a state of panic. We don't do that. Don't lose a little digger. Sometimes I see the bus. I see some lady. She's dressed up. From lady. Dressed up to go to a chasna. She took her two hours to put herself together. She sees the bus, and then she's running in high heels, and she's all over the place running. I got a lady. Come on, a little dignity. See you. Yeah, yeah. And then her shaitl goes flying off. You know, I know. I got a lady. You know, you're with her. Then you see her limping the next day because she's running in high heels. So yeah, there's got to be a little, you know, I'll get a hold for a few minutes. There's got to be a little forethought. There's got to be a little forethought what you're doing. Number one. Other commentaries say that this idea of behola, you see, what it is, it's a sense of, we just read it in the previous Pasuk, we said the last Pasuk, five lines from the top, it says, komemius, I will take you upright. There are commentaries that say that ole, komemius, we will live upright with the confidence that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is watching over us. And our, our life is being governed by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Behola is that sense that we're on our own. There's a sense of helplessness. There's corona and, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? That's a sense of we're, we're, everything is random, haphazard, and out of control. Number one. Number two, and this is what I really want to get to. There are, there are, um, um, one of the commentaries translated Behola is a lack of patience. We're unsettled. We're always a lack of patience. Let me ask you a question. Do you think in our day and age we have more patience or less patience than our grandparents or great grandparents? Way less. Way less. I've seen guys in front of a computer and you got to wait 10 seconds for something. <laughs> it's a dinosaur. <laughs> and a guy, get, guy gets a, you know, in the old days, in the old days to travel to Israel, in, in the 50s when you flew to Israel, was five legs of a, a five leg five eight-hour flights to get to Israel. You had to fly from New York to, to Canada, from Canada to Canada, if I, on, a, on a propeller plane. It was five eight-hour uh, eight flights to get to Israel. Nowadays, you get on a plane, so you go to the airport, and they announce, okay, there's going to be a 20-minute delay. And you're like, <laughs> you know, well, we just want to make sure the wing doesn't fall off at 35,000 feet. Yeah, all right, but not more than 20 minutes. You know, you know that, that's our attitude nowadays. We haven't gotten more patient. You got a microwave. You know, you put a, if the microwave can't get your popcorn done by the time the commercial is over, life isn't worth living, right? You got, you got to put. I know a guy. Who, I got a guy who had a microwave and he got rid of it. I know a guy. Got Tom McCall, he had a microwave in the house and he saw his kids once they put, I think, a potato into the microwave. They were very frustrated how long it took the potato to go. So six minutes, eight minutes, whatever. They get frustrated. You know, in the old days, you had to put a potato in an oven. It takes you 45 minutes to get a potato done, and then you're lucky if it's all done. And they're getting frustrated. He said to me, "What is it? What is it turning them into?" You got to have instant, instant, what do you call it? Everything's got to be instant. You got no, you got what? So somebody said, yes, yeah, so get rid of your washing machine. Uh -oh. You know, get rid of your washing machine. It also does it faster than when you wash it by hand. There's a big difference. Nobody's standing by the washing machine. Mm, I can't wait. <laughs> you, know, you know, it'll get done. You'll, you'll have something else to wear. But the potato, the popcorn, you're sitting there like, you're, we become what you got. So we're less patient. Why are we less patient? It's a curse. This is a curse. All this is a curse. Where did it come from? So one of the commentary says, one of the first says, it's because we don't have patience in Avodos Hashem. We don't have patience. You have patience to sit through davening. You don't have patience to sit through a shear. I don't say you, me, all of us. I have patience to sit through this. I have patience to listen to somebody who's pouring out their heart and they need some help. You have the patience. We're not always in a rush. The people who can't wait for Shabbos to end. The people who are looking at their watch. I can't wait for Shabbos to end. What's wrong with Shabbos? Shabbos is the source of bracha. It's makor ha bracha. It's a, I can't wait to get out of the blessing into the weekday curse. Can you understand how ridiculous that is? People are like, yeah, I can't wait. We have no patience. So mita, kenege and mita. HaKadosh Baruch brings behola. We're in, always in a state of, <laughs> we're, we're just moving. People haven't got a chance to breathe. And, you know, you're just moving and moving and moving and moving. That's all part of the curse. 
Then he says that the shachafas and kadachas, so this is pretty frightening, because these are two, how did the article translate them, shachafas? Uh, swelling lesions and burning fever, right? So, so uh, according to one opinion, swelling lesions need, uh, which one is it? I forgot which one it is. Uh, the shachafas needs a certain dryness. And, if the, and the kadachas needs a fever, need, 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 needs, needs moisture. It means you're, you're going to have things that you're, whichever way, whatever you do is not good for you. Whatever you do, you're out of the frying pan into the fire. Yeah, whatever you do, you got two ailments, and what treats one ailment messes up the other ailment. Then he says the same thing. If you take, take a look for a second. Go ahead for a second the Puzzle Cafe. Take a look at Puzzle Cafe um, on, on 7.12, uh, eight lines from the top. It says, V'avesi alechem, eight lines from the top. V'avesi alechem cherv no chemes de cambris. I'll bring a sword. V'nesaftem al orechem. What do you do if there's fighting, if there's, if there's fighting outside? What do you do? What's the best place to go when there's, when there's bullets flying and there's swords, arrows? Where do you, where do you, where do you go? Other What's that? The opposite, the opposite direction. What if there is no opposite direction? Where do you go? Yeah. That's on the outside. You go inside. You know, you, you cover, you close yourself inside. Look at the rest of the puzzle. V'shilach di dever b'sochachem. Then there's going to be plague. What do you do when there's plague? You try to go outside. Now, you, so you're in a situation of the lesser of two evils. That's part of the curse. The part of the curse is there's nowhere to go. You're inside or you go outside. Where, where, what are you supposed to do over here? You're supposed to go in, you're supposed to go out. If you're inside, it's like, you're right, if there'd be a war and there's corona going on at the same time, what are you supposed to do? Everybody gather inside, uh, but there's a limit of 10. <laughs> you know, oh, you're the last way, you know, you know what, what are you going to do? That's part, that's part of the curse, okay? Now, take a look at Puzzle Yud I just want to go through it. It's our last day, so uh, on this prize. So I just want to cover this very quickly. Yona, what were we going to ask very quickly? Behola, behola, the, the, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, you know, and, and we have this constant, like, drive to, like, we want to, you know, catch that train, we want to run. But, like, you know, catching a train might, might save us, like, a lot of time, right? It, it might, it might, but, but, but being in the habit of behola will cost you more in the long term. And it's always a question in life. That's always, it's a good question. It's a good point you bring it up. It's always a question in life. Sometimes you have to sacrifice the immediate for the overall cause. We were just talking in sheer about getting into the habit of not taking anything without permission. I know, there's a halacha, if you see, if I know for a fact that, that he doesn't mind if I borrow, he's not here, and uh, Kai's not here and his phone is on the table. I know for a fact, for a 100% fact, he doesn't mind if I make use of his phone without asking him. I know for a fact, it's not a good habit. It's not a good habit. Because if I'll tell, now I'll take his phone, and he probably doesn't mind if I use his car, Right? And he probably doesn't mind if I move into his house, right? And he probably, and he graduate, and he probably doesn't mind if I take over the planet. Yeah, and there's no end to that sort of thing. And therefore, it's a good habit. I, it's going to cost me right now. I got to wait. I want to tell you something. I once had, I shouldn't say this in public, but I will. I, my wife got upset with me. Could you believe it? I, could you believe it? I, I know it's hard to believe. She once got upset with me when early, early years of marriage because she's very non confrontational. And I, and whatever the opposite of non-confrontational is, or I used to be anyway. So I came home one day and I was upset. I was at the bank. And the guy at the the guy, the, 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 the guy behind the counter at the bank was clearly unhappy about his job. And he was making the line wait. He was clearly drained. He was clearly taking his time and also looking in a drawer. Everything it was it was obvious. And I know I'm an expert on detecting when people are provoking other people because I did that all the time. So I know it takes one to know one. So this guy was really big. And so by the time I, I, I was getting frustrated and I started, you know, I, I, I became progressively more unpleasant. And we had a confrontation. And I came home and I said to my wife, I had a confrontation. And what happened? I told her, I, you know, I exploded at this guy in the bank because he was behaving inconsiderately. She said, you should have walked out of the bank. I said, well, I had to get stuff taken care of. You should have turned around and walked out. I said, but if I walk out, then I'm going to not get it taken care of. So her argument is, not her argument, her position, not her position, her decision is that, 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 that in the long term, there are two things. I won't get that done, but it's not good for my amigos, which is more important in life. 
And if the more you do those things, then you're going to have that mita is not is going to stay in you. So it's going to be there's always that there's always that 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 what do you call it? When I got married, I played. My wife watched me play basketball, and after she watched me play a couple of times, she put me on probation for six months. True story. She said you can't play anymore. Why? She said every bad mita known to man comes out when you play basketball. You're haughty. You get angry. You're selfish. You're on probation. Right? So I begged, pleaded, cajoled, groveled, got permission finally after six months, went out and broke my foot. Right? That, was the, that, was, that was the end of my basketball career. So, so you, uh, well, hey, yeah, but I can't play that? Yeah, but that, that's not good for you right now. So sometimes in life, you're right. You're sacrificing something, but what's the, what's the long term? What, you're going to live your whole life? So this is the I'm going to run for the train. And the next time you're going to do this, and then you're going to go and invest very quickly because some guy tempted you with an investment, and you're going to throw your money in and behold and the next thing you know, you're in bigger trouble. And therefore, it's better to develop the habit and sacrifice something right now for the sake of a certain development. That's, it. That's the idea. Okay. In Pasuk Yud Zion, and nobody crossed me. In Pasuk Yud Zion, uh, five lines from the bottom. V'nasati padai b'chem. By the way, she has only yelled at me three times in almost 40 years of marriage. How do you like that? Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. You know why? <laughs> I didn't say she's only gotten upset with me three times. She's gotten upset with me many times. Dozens, hundreds. But she, then she, gives, she just gives me the silent treatment. That's worse. That's Gehenna. <laughs> and I used to walk. In the, early, in the early days, well, she hasn't got, in the early days, I used to follow her around the house. I just said, please talk to me. Please, please talk to me. <laughs> not, not a word. So one time, one time I, 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 I lost the passports. We were going away to America. And on the date of the, of the trip to see her parents, <laughs> I went to early check-in, and I get to early check-in, I miss my passport. My, my wife and I are missing our Israeli passports, right? And I didn't know what I did with them. I was so scared. The kids I had for everything, I didn't have our Israeli passports. So I called home, and I was trembling. I called home, and she was like, like she goes checking in the closet. I hear her checking the closet. She comes back to the phone, and she says, we don't have Israeli passports. Then she said it very loudly. <laughs> I got, we don't have it. <laughs> okay, okay. I didn't even have to take a plane to America. <laughs> so that was once. And the other time was I went to fix water on Arab Shabbos. She was, we had a whole house full of guests coming and, coming. and I went up to the roof because we had a leak in one of the bathrooms. It was slow leak. So I went up to her and I turned off all the water in the house. And she's cooking. We had a whole house full of guests coming. And she says, she yells from downstairs, did you turn off the water? I said, yeah, well, I just want to turn <laughs> the water. I didn't know women need water to cook. I thought you'd cook food. I didn't know what you need water for. Right? <laughs> and the third time when I took a medicine, I had an allergic reaction and almost died. So she was a little perturbed about that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah gosh, well, she needs the credit card. So she was, a, so, <laughs> it wasn't even my fault. That time wasn't even my fault. I took a, I took a medicine that I'd been taking all this, something called Uptelgen. It's a, it's a pain reliever. I took it during, towards Mosei Shabbos. And then as, about a half hour later, all of a sudden my lips start swelling. My lips start swelling, and I know because I've had allergic reactions. My lips are like, uh oh, and that was a, and, 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 and but it was really neat because it swelled all the way across. It was really like really a pattern. It went all the way. I was intrigued. It went all the way across. <laughs> then it went up to my upper lip, and it, it was like well, one thing after just like so, so my lips swelled up. Then it went to my left eye, puffed up. Then my right eye puffed up. And she was jumping, my wife was just jumping up and like, you idiot, you're not supposed to take these. And it wasn't my fault. This was really not my fault. So, and at a certain point, my voice started going, which just means my airways are shutting down. So that's not really good. So I called my doctor and he said, yeah, go to, go to Tarim right now. Right. He even told me afterwards, it was a mistake, he should have called me up to his office. He lives in Boston, give, give me a shot. So I get in a cab with my daughter, and I go over to tear him. You know, it's the first, the emergency. So the lady's at the counter, she says, you walk up. The guy before me shows her his finger, and then another guy. And I'm waiting in line, and she looks up, and I said, I'm having an allergic reaction. I'm having an allergic reaction. She goes, yes, yes, you are. <laughs> she goes, go. That was really cool, by the way. And I was, I was innocent, it wasn't even my fault. So in Pasuk Yud Zion, it says like this. It says like this, Vinasati Panai Bachem, five lines from the bottom, I will turn my uh, 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 attention on you. Vinigaftem Lifteoivechem, you will be destroyed before your enemies. Virodu Bachem Sonechem, 
the ones that hate you will dominate you. You're going to run away, nobody's even chasing you. So the commentaries ask, what's the difference between oivechem and sonechem? What's oivechem, your enemies, and sonechem, those who hate you? So one of the, uh, one of the opinions here is oivechem are the anti-Semites of the world. Sonechem are the Jews who give us a hard time. They're not even our enemies. They're, they're from our, from, it says sonechem means those who are among us and hate us. Those Jews, sometimes you got the biggest problem maker, the biggest, the biggest enemy through history. There have been Jews who have been apostates. Uh, I think the, the Ramban and the famous debate between the Ramban and Pablo Christiani was a Jewish apostate. He was a Jew who went over to Christianity. There have been many Jews who became Catholic, who, who, who converted, then it became, they became more Catholic than the Pope. This is always, in the United States, if you ever see a, a flag out on the lawn on the 4th of July, it's a Jew. Right? You know, you're, you're more American than the Americans. You know, that's the way it works. And you, you want to just show that you're part of them. So we have suffered, and then you see in Israel, where you have a secular government telling us how to educate our kids and trying to pass laws of how we should run schools, because in our schools and in the secular state schools, you know, they have problems and we have problems. They have uh, plastic knife cutters and uh, security guards checking for weapons. And we have kids who once are all bench, bench too fast, you know. So, you know, they, they're going to tell us how to run our families and how to run. So, so we don't have Ruch Hashem, we don't have drug abuse in the schools. And there's no teen, teen pregnancies among, among uh, Haredi Jews unless the girl's already married, uh, which could very likely be, you know. But, but we don't have those problems. So they're, and they're telling us for your good, we're passing these laws for your good because anyway you're a bunch of parasites that sit in kolo and do nothing all day. Right. So uh, that, that, that's, those are the enemies from among us. Now, Posik Chof, turn to the next page. You're going to waste your energy, energies on nothing. The land will not produce and give its produce. So the commentaries say here, the plain meaning is that you're going to waste your energy. Like I said, it said earlier, you're going to plant your field, the enemies are going to conquer it, they're going to take over all your work. But it, 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 uh, more of a, of, a Musr less, uh, of a Musr level, there's the idea that people think that they have unlimited energy. And a lot of people waste their energy on a lot of different things. You waste your energy chasing money, you waste your energy on entertainment, then you got nothing left, you got nothing. I get the show, I haven't got energy left for davening because I wasted my energy on other things. You wasted your energy on, I haven't got time for it, my head isn't, isn't ready for learning because I've been so busy using my head for other things. But even within Yiddishkeit, now listen carefully what I tell you, even within Yiddishkeit, there's always a question of, should I take on a chumrah or not? A stringency. And halacha, there are various halachic stringencies lurking. Should I take on a halachic stringency? So the answer to that is a lot depends. Because I'm convinced that a person, especially at our level, I'm not talking about the Reb Chaim Kinevskis of the world and the, and, 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 and the Reb Aaron Shtemans and the Reb of the world. People at our level, we have, let's face it, we have a certain amount of energy that we could sink into our spiritual growth, and, and we, need to, we need to kick back a little bit. We have to conserve energy. We can't go on too, too little sleep. Uh, you don't cut back on the amount of sleep you need. You cut back on the amount of sleep you would like. How many hours of sleep do you need? I need seven hours sleep a night, six hours sleep a night. You don't cut back on that. That's not how you serve Hashem. But you don't need 11 hours sleep. That you could cut back on. There's always the same thing when it comes to food. There's a certain amount of food that we need, a certain amount of food that we'd like. That's where your area of cutting back is. Not what you need. You don't cut back on your needs. Everybody else has. Reb Chaim Kineski for a while was going on one hour sleep at night. So his, so his grandson asked him, how do you do it? He said, listen, I, I, I have a lot of people who have been coming and needing me. I don't have time for to finish my daily quota, so I have to finish my daily quota. He didn't answer how you go on one hour sleep. You know, I don't know how you go on one hour sleep. He didn't answer that question. He just said he had to do it, so he did it, and he seemed to be okay. People like us have a certain amount of energy to devote into the spiritual realm. Often it happens, if you take on a chumrah, a stringency, in one area, it's going to come off of your energy somewhere else. So a person, instead of being focused on something which you have to do, like not speaking Lashon Hara, or being considerate of other people, a person is taking that spiritual energy and channeling it somewhere else. 
How do you know how much? It's a difficult thing to know exactly. But sometimes you could be using up that energy. I heard a debate today, which is an interesting debate about free choice versus predetermination. Hashem knows and we choose. And, that, and, and here are these raging debates. It's a waste of energy. Because that energy could be better used into trying to figure out a tosos. And if you put mental energy into an area, which you're not going to understand anyway, right? Yeah, that has been argued since the time of the Rambam, right? So unless you're the Rambam, drop it. Because you're not, you are, you're curious about it? I'm curious about it too. But at the end of the day, you got to get up tomorrow morning and dive in and put on tefillin. So nothing's going to help you anyway. Right? Whether, whether you understand it or not, you still can't eat trafe, right? So, so, so that, that you're wasting mental energy, intellectual energy. And so that's v'sam l'riko chachet. Now, more than that, the, uh, uh, in Pesach Hafdala, this is the key point today. It says, v'alachti ani af, it says, uh, um, uh, pick it up on Pesach of Gimel. Six lines from the top. V'im be'ele lo tivosrili, if you do not take the lesson from me, how does he chat? If you will not be chastised towards me. In other words, if after seeing the calamities, you don't do tshuva. V'halachtem imi keri. And you will go with me by, how does he translate it? Casually. Okay, for lack of a perfect English word to translate carry. Then Hashem says, I will also go casually with you. Now I'll you seven times, another seven times. So this idea of casually, the Mephoshim say, what does that mean? HaKadosh Baruch is bringing punishments and we take it casually. Where does that come from? Where does that come from? Why would we be so casual about getting zapped, about getting punished? Where, when are you casual? You're casual when you don't feel that it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu doing it. So what does HaKadosh Baruch Hu say? Valachti afanim I'll also be casual. How does HaKadosh Baruch Hu get casual? You know, Friday casual. You know, uh, how does HaKadosh, what does it mean that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is casual? What does it mean that we're casual? So first I explain like this. What's a person's attitude supposed to be when a person sees he's getting going through various challenges or ordeals. What's the attitude of this? The Gemara Bracha says, if a person sees that he's suffering, yefashpesh b'masov. Yefashpesh b'masov, do some soul searching. If a person sees that, if, uh, let's say for example, a person got his finger caught in the door. It's a wonder, why did this happen to me? Why did it happen? And the person says, you know what, I've been shoplifting lately. Okay, well, you know, get your act together. Now, we can't, be careful, we don't know and you can't know in the absence of a prophet or an Adam Godel who sometimes knows why. We don't know why a it ha- we don't know why a certain thing happened. But what we're supposed to do is a little soul searching. So a guy bites his tongue. So you're supposed to think, I bit my tongue, you know. Mmm, a little Lushan Hara, a little bit of uh, Onaz Dvar. Yeah, try to think of things with speech. Is that the reason? Not necessarily, but at least it gets you to do some soul searching. And more importantly, it makes us realize that what happened wasn't random and haphazard. That's the most important thing. That if something is going wrong, then we understand that it's not random and haphazard. That our Kodesh Baruch brought the suffering. We do the soul searching in order to at least do some soul searching. Is this the reason? It might be yes, it might be no. But at least it got us to do a little bit of soul searching. If you're going through this suffering, when is suffering a kapara? Suffering is a kapara when you ascribe it to HaKosh Baruch Hu. HaKosh Baruch Hu says, if you behave casually, you think that it's random and haphazard that a, person is, that a person is suffering, I'll also be casual with you. Meaning, the Meforshim say, that HaKosh Baruch Hu says, this does not come off your, it doesn't come off your score. That means a person could suffer, and he does not gain anything from the suffering as far as an atonement, because he doesn't believe that the suffering is coming from HaKosh Baruch Hu. So we have an obligation when a person goes through a challenge or suffering or misses a train. Something simple like missing a train. Nothing is random and haphazard to the nth degree. It's all brought to Stipler writes about how a person has to know nothing is random or haphazard. Remember the story with Yosef when he got kidnapped and he's beaten and cursed and everything else except for one thing that was, uh, the one thing that broke the pattern, which was what? A spice train. Wow, what a great, what a great, what a beautiful, beautiful place for a kidnapping. That means if a person is going to be kidnapped, they should definitely opt for, 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 uh, what do you call it, for, for uh, 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 Muslims who are in a spice train 
instead of in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a crude oil train. Because after all, who wants to have to smell that? Right? So the Vaporsham say over there, what's the lesson of the Torah? The Torah is teaching you, does Yosef have to suffer? Yes, he has to be sold, he has to be beaten, he has to be kidnapped, he has to go through everything. But he was, did not have to go through the bad smell. Therefore, the, it means that the suffering is measured to a precise degree, to, it, to the nth degree. And if a person doesn't do that, then of course, Baruch goes casually with us as well. Okay. Um, take a look at... Um, I was wild when I saw this shot. Not wild, wild, but wild. I was very excited about this. In Pesach it says like this, because I actually had a question on this Pesach, and I just recently saw that Rav Steinman Zatzal had the same question, and one of the other Mephoshim answers it. Yeah, I, I had this question. Every year I've seen this, I had the same question. I didn't, I didn't pursue it much. I had the question, and I saw this year Rav Steinman asked the same question, and then one of the other Mephoshim gives an answer, which is exactly what we need for Lagba Omer. Right, so it, this gets a psh, right. So take a look. It says like this: You'll have a vengeful sword coming after you. I guess that's worse than a regular sword. You will gather into your cities. You know, you're 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 hiding from the enemy. Then you'll have plague because when you're all gathered together, that's not healthy. Then you'll be handed into the hands of the enemies. Now take a look at Rashi here. You have to see the Rashi inside. It's uh, what it's uh, left side five lines from the top. If you find it, please, please, uh, please show the person next to you. I want you to see this inside. Left column of Rashi, five lines from the top toward the end of the line. It says, "Vinitatem biyad, you'll be put in the hand of your enemies. Ha'oivim hatzorim alechem." The enemies who laid siege to your cities. That's how they used to fight war. You laid siege to the cities. And you gathered into your cities, hiding from the sword. But then you're going to fall into the hand of the enemies. Why is that? <laughs> you don't leave a dead body in Yerushalayim. They didn't bury in Yerushalayim. <laughs> when they would take the... The, the, the mace out of Yerushalayim to bury him during the siege of the first base of the second base of Mikdash, whatever it is, they befall into the hands of the enemy. So I had my, what was my kasha? What was my, you guys know me. What was my, what do you think about my, what was bothering me here about this Rashi? What's bothering me? It bothered me. Every year I saw this Rashi, I was curious. I wasn't bothered, I didn't say bothered. I'm mean, bothered when I get electric pills. I wasn't bothered, I was curious. What was I curious about? What's that? Well, they're in your, they're accustomed that they didn't bury, there's a minute you didn't bury people in your shalai. So they take the body out and then they would fall into the hands of the enemies. So I'll tell you what's bothering, what's bothering me is that, all right, if it happened to the first group of people, say they didn't know. But the second time somebody died, where are you going? Right? There's no, it's not a halacha that you have to give up your life not to bury somebody in your shalim. It's not a derisa, it's not a derabonah, it's a minag. If it, it's an Indian, it's a minag, maybe a dera, maybe derabona. Certainly not derisa. What are you going out of your shalim for? What, what, what's that? You're going out of your shalim? The enemies are there. Not only that, halachically it's prohibited to take, to get, to fall at the end of the enemy, to not bury, bury the body in your shalim. You can't go, Allah, for it, be Moser Nefesh to bury the body. What, what happened to you over here? That was what's bothering me. Why, why would they do that if they know you're going to fall in the hands of the enemies? That was the Kasha Enrif. Then I saw a statement had this question also. So one of the commentators answers, this is what happens when you become disloyal to Torah. You become disloyal to Torah, you start distorting things. And you start taking the things which are not as important, and you make them more important than other things. Right? And then you start going to places to, 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 because instead of learning Torah, you go visit a Holocaust museum because you think that's important. Or instead of learning Torah, you go to Meron on Lagba Omer because you think that's important. Right? I'm not talking about having a trip for fun. I'm talking about when you think it's a mitzvah. I'm talking about when you think it's important. And Reb Chaim Kineski, every time somebody said, uh, my father's sick, should we, go to, should, we daven, should we go to daven at a kever? Learn. That'll be a mer bigger, bigger merit for your father. Right? Uh, should we, uh, what do you call it? my mother's yard site, should we do something special? Learn. That'll be the biggest marriage for your mother. Right? Should we go to Meron and Lago? Stay in Yeshiva and learn. And, 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 you want it? So that's why I always tell people, you want to go because you enjoy it, I have no problem. Guy says, I want to go to Europe to visit the concentration camps. 
You want to go because you feel that, you know, you'd like to go. I mean, I care. It's like you go to an amusement park, no, no comparison, by the way. But you're doing it because it's something, you, you know, you'd like to do. And it's a little easier, a little, uh, what do you call it? You know, and you have a nice trip and you go around. Uh, okay. Uh, everybody's got their areas of where, where they got to, where they, where they got to, you know, you know, release a little bit. But if you think it's a mitzvah, that's when you're making a mistake. Don't tell me about it. Somebody told me they're going to Switzerland. Somebody told me once they're going to Switzerland, making a trip. A couple's going to Switzerland. He said, you know, it is a mitzvah to see God's creation. Uh-huh. Oh, I see. Uh-huh. Oh, what, what, what a madrega. Are they going to Switzerland? That means you're not going to get any Swiss chocolate while you're there, huh? No, no. Swiss chocolate's also God's creation. Yeah, yeah that's also a mitzvah. Uh-huh. It's a mitzvah. If you're doing a mitzvah, forget about it. Don't do mitzvahs. If you, if you're, if you want to go because you want a vacation, so tell me you want to go. You know, what are you embarrassed to go again? Somebody reads the newspaper and says, you know, it's a mitzvah to relax. Hey, mitzvah to relax. Hey, you can relax with a mishnayos also. Right? You want to read the newspaper because you enjoy reading. So hey, I enjoy reading the newspaper. I used to tell my sons when they read the Israeli news, they know you get the fr the, the frum newspaper. There's the frum newspaper. So they get lashon hara and lashon hakodesh. Right. So so you get the you get the, you get the, you get the you get the frum the frum the, the frum newspaper. So I used to tell my sons. If you want to read, if you're reading the newspaper because you think it's important to know the news, don't read it. If you want to read it because you enjoy it, then you can do it. But if you think it's important, it's not important. Anything that you need to know, you'll find out about. If, you, if it applies to you and you need to know, you'll find out about it. And if you didn't find out about it, it wasn't that important. So you want to read it because you enjoy reading it? Say that people have their enjoyment. Don't distort things. And especially when it comes to we're traveling to this grave in Europe and we're traveling to that. Everybody's traveling to graves nowadays in Europe. That, that, that's the new hawk, especially the people who finance it, who make money off of it. You know, that's become the new thing. That's exactly what the Torah is talking about here. You're going to be so distorted in your values and in your priorities, you're willing to die not to bury a body in your shalayim. What happened to you? What happened to you? What's really important in life? A guy says, a guy, they're, they're sitting there saying, they're saying kinos on Tisha B'av. You know, you say the, 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 the kinos. So they're in a shul, and they're saying kinos. And there's a blind man in the shul. And he gets up at Tisha B'av, And he goes over to one of the guys and says, listen, I'm not feeling so. Do you mind walking me home? So he says, listen, I'm saying kinos. I don't have time. So the rub of the shul walks over, and he says to the blind man, here, I'll take you home. He turns to the guy and says, keep saying, keep saying kinos. You should say kinos. But not because Yerushalayim is in ruins. Say Kinos because you're in ruins. Right? You don't understand the priority. You think that, that that's what Hashem wants you right now. That's what Hashem wants you to do. That's your priority. That's what the Torah is talking about. And a person is capable of getting to all sorts of distortions. One last point. One last point and we stop. Take a look all the way at Perik of Zion, Pesach Zion. Perik of Gimel, Pesach Zion. You should pay me for this. Chav Zayin, what did I say? Chav Gimel Zayin. Chav Gimel, oh, Chav Zayin, oh, yeah, Chav Zayin, Chav Zayin Zayin, yeah. Ooh. I'm still getting my Gimels and Zayins mixed up. How do you like that after all these years? <laughs> Chav Zayin Zayin. So here is the section of the Torah that talks about when, uh, page, page uh, 718. This is the section of the Torah that talks about if a person decides to donate his value and he says, Erki Alai, for example. He wants to donate his value to the base of Migdash. He says, Erki Alai. Why would he do it that way? Hey, this guy's driving and he had a near miss in traffic. He doesn't have cash and he wants to make sure to bind himself in to pledge it in a way that he's bound to do it. So he won't forget when he gets home. So the guy says, Erki Alai, I'll give it. I pledge my value to the base of Migdash, for example. Okay? Now, the Torah goes over here and he gives you the various values. And if you take a look, the Torah says, Third line from the top. If it's a male from 20 years to 60 years, so it's 50 shekel kesef. And if it's a woman, it's 30 shekel kesef. That's the value. And if it's a male from 5 years to 20 years, so then it's 20. And for a woman, it's 10. And from a month to 5 years, obviously he can't pledge it. The father says, I'm pledging his value to the base of Mikdash. So for a male, it's 5 shekelim. And for a female, it's 3 shekelim kesef. And then it says in Pesach Zion, from 60 years and on, if it's a male, it's 15, and for a female, it's 10. So Rashi points out, up till age 60, for the male it was 50, and for the female it was 30. After age 60, for the male it's 15, and for the female it's 10. Who deteriorated more? The man. She's only a third, he's more than a third. Take a look at Rashi. Rashi says, right column, four lines from the bottom. 
ואם היא בן שישים שנה, כשמגיע לימי הזקנה, when you get to old age, האיש הקרוב אליך שלו, the woman is closer to be considered like the man, because לפיכך האיש פוחס בזדקנו יוסר משליש בערכו. He deteriorates more than a third. והאישה אינה פוחסס אלא שליש מערכה. And then one of my favorite lines in all of Rashi and all of Torah. Says Rashi, why? She closes the gap. She's only five behind him. Why? Says Rashi. De Amri Inchi. Because people, there's an old saying. Sova Bevesa. When there's an old man in the house. Pacha Bevesa. There's a nuisance in the house. There's an obstacle in the house. Savta Bevesa. When there's an old lady in the house. Sima Bevesa. There's a treasure in the house. Visimana Tova Bevesa. And a good, uh, why? An old man in the house, what does he do? Kvetch. A lot of kvetching. <laughs> telling stories over and over that you've heard. Yeah. Telling stories over and over that you've heard. Yeah. Telling stories over and over that you've heard. Okay. Right? Losing his teeth. Right? And trafing up the kitchen. Oh, yeah. right? That's what an old man does in the house. A woman does essentially the same thing she's done all along, except a little, maybe a little slower. But she's got more wisdom. She still makes chicken soup. She still can take care of the babies. She still does this. She knows all about what, what to do when you have a stomach ache. She got off. What is the man doing? He's not doing what he used. He used to work out of the house. Now he's sitting in the house, getting in everybody's way. You know, all he is is a nuisance in the house. Why is the Torah telling us this? I mean, just to say, ha ha, you are a nuisance. Why is the Torah telling us this? The answer is that the Torah is telling us so you don't end up this way. If a person, when he's younger, develops a taste for a little bit of Torah, for a little bit of ruchnias. When you get old, you know, people sometimes they work their whole life saving money for their retirement. I never understood that. You know, you're 25 years old, you're, you're working to save money for your retirement. I got news for you. Uh, uh, harpooning off the coast of Nova Scotia isn't going to be the same when you're 65 or 70 as it is when you're 25. And when you're, when you're, when you're 70 years old, all that money that you save when you're 70 years old, all you do is there, you join the geriatric club and you compare medications. That's what you do when you're 70 years old. So all that time you wasted saving money just to get to the point so you can retire. So I would say, develop a taste for ruchnias. Your physical energies are not as what they were. You see old men go to the base managers, they learn dafyomi, they have a life. If you don't develop it now, it's 70 or 80 or 90 years old, a person doesn't have a life. There are people, R R R there was never early, R Rav Chaim Kedefsky never retired, Rav Yashiv never retired, they never retire. They do the same thing they've been doing all along and they're happy to do it. That's why, by the way, that's one of the reasons why you find very little midlife crisis by from Jews who are, who are plugged in. You know, my midlife is the same as my early life, the same as later life, because of what you're doing is what you want to do anyway, what you always want to do. That's what the Torah is teaching you. A person has to prepare now not to become that nuisance later on.